Hello, my name is Tendai Manombo and this is Real Talk. The announcement of the introductions of the Mosio Junior Gold Coins was received with a lot of surprise by the citizens of Zimbabwe. Lots of skepticism has come to the surface and the people of Zimbabwe have come up with various theories on what it truly means to have the gold coin dynamic in the economy. Today we have Respect Gwenzi from Equity Access. He's here to help us understand the matter. Respect is the Managing Director at Equity Access and he's also the Chief Analyst. Please stay tuned to get a firm understanding of the implications of the Mosi Watunya coins. Okay, of respect, you know the RBZ recently introduced gold coins as a measure to just mitigate and um, address the runaway inflation and store value, right? Can you explain the? Can you explain what the gold coins are? Just help the general public to have an understanding of what this is. Okay, thank you. So uh, indeed, um, RBZ is part of measures to contain. Uh, runaway inflation and uh, quite notably the exchange rate that has really uh, gone a war over the past at least six months. I think for context, uh, the exchange rate has depreciated, I mean the Zim dollar uh, has depreciated by about 71% year to date. And um, when you look at it from what normal currencies should do, uh, for example, the RAND against the USD last year, it never went uh, more than 4%. Uh, in terms of in terms of losses, but then when you look at the Zim dollar 2021, the, there was a depreciation of about 24 percent, and in 2019 and 2020, which is the first two years of its uh, since its comeback, it depreciated by an average of about 75 percent in each respective year. So what this means is, when you see your currency losing value at that rate, it means that um, people's purchasing power is being lost, and that currency indeed cannot preserve its value. So um, uh, uh, the RBZ and the government in general have been trying to put measures in the market to try to stem uh, that inflation runaway as well as uh, the, the currency depreciation. So uh, the introduction of gold coins uh, in, in government respect is an effort to try to uh, cushion uh, the depreciation of the exchange rate. I think that's the backdrop against which this specific currency is, is uh, this specific um, coin is being uh, introduced. But your question is, what are what are gold coins? So gold coins, um, th th these are an asset. Uh, by an asset, I mean to say, um, it's 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 an instrument that can uh, store. Um, uh, by that, I think I'm I'm trying to be very careful because. In the context of the global world, when you have a gold coin, it's defined as an investment asset. You can buy it and speculatively hold it in anticipation that it will gain value over the, over the future, in, 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 into the future. And then in the context of Zimbabwe, government is saying we are introducing this coin in order for you to preserve value. Why? Because the value of the gold coin is pegged in line with the gold price on international markets. And it's, it's nothing that is, um, it's in the factors that drive the price of gold on international markets is, is, is not anywhere related to Zimbabwe's macroeconomic uh, situation or, or fundamentals. So if you are buying into an asset that's, whose price is determined in London, on the London Metal Exchange, is divorced from uh, uh, Zimbabwe's situation. So in other words, it has an ability somehow to possibly preserve or cushion uh, one's value. So a gold coin is an asset which uh, normally investors would buy into as a way of trying to look at a possible future profit in terms of, in terms of holding that, uh, that asset. It is just like buying, say, shares in Delta or buying... Um, uh, a, certain, a certain instrument that government might be selling, but uh, in anticipation that investors can generate a return. But government is not putting that clause to say this is an asset which investor or general citizens can buy so that they can earn additional money in future. They're simply saying 
you are buying this asset whose price is not us who are going to determine it, but the international markets. And you are able to store the value of your money. Uh, since holding your money as RTGS could cause you to lose um, value when the exchange rate depreciates. Okay, so is is this enough to to give the citizens confidence to have to to purchase or attain these gold coins? I think it goes to just say, is this the correct measure, or is it um, uh, part of the measures that could possibly contain the current situation that we have? So I think it's 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 important for us to get um, to slow down a bit and, and and also try to understand the nature of, of of these coins. So I will explain in terms of how people arrive at uh, at the value of what's what's a gold coin. So the price of a gold coin is made up of three uh, components. So primarily, like I said, its value is dependent on the value of gold on the London Metal Exchange, which is in the in the UK, right? So, so government so, has no control over this. So government has no control over what happens on an, on an international market. Yes. But gold itself is of value because it's demanded by international investors. So there's demand out there for gold. There's supply, which is coming from resource-based countries like Zimbabwe. So we export our gold so that it can be sold on the London Metal Exchange. So at any given point, if you go online and search gold price, it's being traded every single minute. So there's someone who is demanding, there's someone who, is, who wants to buy. So that's what determines the price in London. And that price is called a spot price. So when you create a gold coin, its price or how you price that coin should be dependent on what's prevailing on that international market. So, for example, right now, gold uh, on the international market, it's, 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 um, it's going for 1,800 ounce. So, when you then look back and try to do the mess around this specific coin that we have, um, when you look at its uh, characteristics and features, it's going to be a 4.4 uh, grams worth. And when you do the mess, that's about two, 287 US dollars. So, you add the spot price. Then you add the production price, which is the cost. So that's what determines the price in London. And that price is called a spot price. So when you create a gold coin, its price or how you price that coin should be dependent on what's prevailing on that international market. Okay. So for example, right now, gold on the international market, it's, 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 um, it's going for 1,800 ounce. So... When you then look back and try to do the mess around this specific coin that we have, um, when you look at its uh, characteristics and features, it's going to be a 4.4 uh, grams worth. And when you do the mess, that's about two, 287 US dollars. So you add the spot price, then you add the production price, which is the cost of producing. Then... It's not only Zimbabwe which has gold coins. South Africa had gold coins since 1967. And that's the most popular gold coin in the rest of the world. It's called the Kruger Rand. Yeah. Then you have the United States. They ha also have a very common, a very popular uh, uh, gold coin. Uh, then you have the UK, the uh, Canada, um, Australia, UK, uh, uh, China. They all have got uh, their gold coins. But there are some who are pre which are preferred more by investors. For example, at its height, the Kruger Rand um, fetched far much higher than other gold coins by about 5%. So beyond the, this price which is set in London, beyond the production cost, there is um, in what's called on demand to say, uh, do people just love uh, Zim gold coins compared to South African coins? So they get to be a premium that's associated with some currencies, uh, some gold coins, which are demanded more by uh, some, some, some investors. So these three components make up the price of what's called a gold coin. So when you go to the Arab Israel or to your bank after the 25th of July, the price of that coin would be maybe closer to 300 uh, US dollars. So you are giving them either your US dollars or your Zim dollar, to buy uh, uh, that, that, um, that, that coin. And the question now comes to say, 
fine, you could achieve preserving value, but is it helping uh, uh, government uh, cushion uh, or reduce the depreciation in the currency? I think that's where, that's where the real question is. And my own understanding and evaluation of the situation is that um, introduction of the currency, of, of the coin, is not in any way going to, 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 to cushion the depreciation of the exchange rate. Why? Because for starters, there's no one who is holding U.S. dollar who has got an... There's no incentive for a person who's holding U.S. dollars to want to go and dispose those... Uh, to, to, to use exchange those, those... To exchange those for gold. Because the whole scheme around that price, which I kept on mentioning, the, la the London price, the, how it's arrived at, it takes experts in the field of investments to be able to say, okay, the price of gold is not going to fall over the next five months or it's going to increase over the next six months. I would have done my projections around demand, around supply, around other factors. So for a basic Zimbabwean who is holding a who is holding their $500 uh, from the mine to then say, I'm putting my money in a gold coin. Which, is an, which I said is an investment asset, which they don't know who's fact, uh, the factors that are going to drive its price. I think it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. It's something that, that, that's not really practical. Mm -hmm. Then furthermore, even for somebody who is not aware of these movements, just basically the trust between government and the people to say the instruments that they have put before, basic things like your bond not, we were made to believe that there's a banking facility in 2016, which was banking the 200 million um, uh, bond, uh, the, the, the bond note that were issued back then. They said we've got 200 million US dollars um, from Africa Zim Bank, which will be able to match pound for pound if this currency falls. Uh, gen the generality of Zimbabwe will receive the similar amount in US dollars if the currency fails. Um, do you think the RBZ will be able to finance gold purchases without further propping, uh, propping up money supply or destabilizing domestic gold production? Yeah, those are, those are huge, huge factors that you have mentioned. I think this is where I see the fall of this uh, whole scheme uh, 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 come into play. Um, so for 2021, we produced about 29 tons. And these 29 tons raked in about 1.3 billion in U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, our total exports for the uh, year 2021 were in the region of 4.9 to, uh, to about 5 billion thereabout. So when you are saying 1 over 1.3 over 5, I think that percentage is, um, is, is, is upwards of 20 percent. It's upwards of 20 percent. So if 20 percent of your exports are coming from one mineral, it means that's the key mineral for the country. So what does it mean? If you take out gold receipts, which are gold export receipts, it simply means Zimbabwe's um, uh, foreign currency position becomes very shaky. In fact, it, we won't be able to sustain this economy without the exportation of gold. So now, let's say it's not every product, uh, produced gold that's going to be still uh, minted. Are we, are we able to even take away 25% of that production and mint the coin. In my view, we, we, we are not even able to sustain um, our, 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 our forex demand. So I think the aspect of disrupting production also comes into play where you are considering that for government to be able to buy gold, because it's not the one that produces gold, it's the producers, independent producers, who are private companies. So they have to go there with US dollars and pay um, the producers. Because if you go to the producers with the Zim dollar, there's, there's always been a challenge where producers are saying, when I'm looking at this US dollar, I am receiving it at what rate? So if somebody's saying, I'm receiving it at the interbank rate, and yet the interbank rate is 50% below the parallel market rate, it means I've lost 50% of my income. So in other words, Producers are bound to side market, which is to sell by themselves across the country, take it to Mozambique, take it to... And for top producers who are monitored by Arab business, they can simply reduce production. So we're really just going round and round in circles. Yeah, so in, in essence, it's not possible for governments to be uh, going in to buy um, gold in U.S. dollars and coming in with it to me and say pay uh, RRTGS. 
in essence, where would they get the forex? Because the idea of exporting is so that we get forex, so that we meet the country's needs. So in this case, I'm taking the gold from there, I'm paying US dollars, then I'm letting you buy in RITGS, and yet I need to import fuel and so forth and so forth. So clearly, it's, it's not a sustainable scheme. And further, to the point that you mentioned to say, is this not going to even fuel further crisis? I feel that it, it, it potentially can. Because when I see that uh, your strategy is to uh, possibly, uh, uh, um, is to possibly uh, come with, possibly that you come to the producers with um, Zim dollars, right? When I know that the exchange rate differentials between the auction market and the, and the product is about 20 or 30 percent, clearly I start producing less. And that is a ripple effect on all exporters in the country. They start to feel the pinch and they reduce their production. And on the net, our export receipts also, also come down. And for those with access, those who are buying with local currency, I can simply go and buy, right? I look for a market of that uh, gold that's contained within my coin. And I can sell, uh, I can still sell that coin for a higher uh, figure in, in Zim dollars and keep on doing that. So you can actually go and buy real value. The currency depreciates. You go there, you sell uh, at a higher price, and you keep on doing that. So it can actually, it can actually uh, spiral or increase the rate at which inflation is increasing in the, in the, in the, in the economy. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for that. We're just going to take a very quick break, and we'll be back after this. Thanks. Welcome to our second segment. We're here with Respect from Equity Access, which is talking about the issue of the gold coins, as was announced by the RBZ. And Respect is just getting giving us a better understanding of what this means and how it will work. So now, Respect, according to the RBZ, these gold coins will be traded for both uh, in both the Zim dollar and the US dollar, like you mentioned earlier, right? And available to both domestic and international investors. In your opinion... Will this be able to address the twin challenge of depreciation of the Zim dollar and the price inflation? Yeah, so I think just trying to look at um, the ability of this measure to contain the, the, the twin challenges, it's clearly not going to do so. But I think when you, if, if, if government is to sell in local currency, like, uh, like I mentioned, the challenge there is it creates a challenge where producers will eventually feel deprived. And those with access to both the buying and the selling, they can manipulate the system and continue to do what's arbitrage trading, that is buying from one market and selling it to the other. Mm -hmm. So I think selling in the domestic currency is clearly not a viable option. But at the end of the day, it's equally also the only measure which can possibly help them reduce money supply. But it's, 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 it's two-sided. Uh, if you want to mop up excess liquidity in the, in the market, you buy that asset which is causing excess liquidity. So in this case, we've got a whole lot of RITGS in the system. So that, um, that uh, liquidity levels, they have increased by over 150% year on year from, since last year in June to debt. So when money supply grows in that faster pace, you need to slow it down. Or you actually need to remove the excess because that growth in RITGS is what ends up demanding the scarcity uh, US dollars on the market. So... 
in order for this demand coming from this money to US dollars to come off, you divert attention. So what they were trying to do was trying to look at an alternative asset which people would demand with their RTGS mm -hmm. and start buying so that they take back the excess money that's in the system and reduce demand that used to go to the US dollars. So this, in my view, would so be the mindset. The pressure, so so they, they would have shifted the pressure. But there comes that other question which I... The, the, the issue that I pose to you to say, when you take that money, are you not also reducing your ability to earn foreign currency? Because that gold was supposed to be exported so that it increases supply of the foreign currency. So in other ways, this measure is counteractive in whichever way you look at it. Yes, you may say I've reduced um, pressure on USD, because people are, have now put their money, their local currency, in gold coins. But is government able to hold on to RTGS and forego earning ex, uh, extra US dollars, which would have come out of exporting? So to me, it's, we don't have... That would have come into play had we had sufficient reserves. So I didn't speak about the issue of gold reserves in the country. So I said we produced 20, about 29 tons last year. So we depleted our reserves in 2007, 2008. At that time, we, we, we were only left with about three tons. But at the present moment, Zimbabwe does not have any gold reserves. Suppose we were a bigger country with excess reserves or with three-year reserves. In other words, we would have production that covers three years. So we would have 100, 100 tons of gold. What that does is, you can say, we are confident in our currents. We want to mop up that excess liquidity. We mint coins using this extra money and not depriving uh, ourselves as a country of this foreign currency that we still need to use um, uh, in our day to day. We we'll still export, but we will tap into our reserves and mint coins so that we reduce every excess liquidity that's pushing pressure on this. But we don't have the reserves. So we are simply going to take what's being produced and mint the coin and deprive exports. And are we able to do that as a... So in other ways, even if you sell in RTGS, it's practically not possible. You cannot sustain that move for beyond two to three months because... Government cannot hold on to RTGs because what we need as a country right now is U.S. dollars as well. Right. So you are going to reduce U.S. dollar inflow and hold on to RTGs and do what with it when it's depreciating. So in essence, this measure is counteractive. And what happens when you sell in U.S. dollars? When you sell in U.S. dollars, like I said, you may not find takers because if the idea is to preserve value, already in U.S. dollars my, my value is preserved. As a common man in Bari, when I'm holding on to my $10, I know it's my, that's $10. It has always been $10. But if you tell me that put it in gold so that it can, at uh, some point you still, I'll, I'll be saying, yeah, I'll, I'll be saying it's cryptic because I, I don't know, I don't even know the charge that's going to come from me transacting with the bank to be able to get that coin. So and I don't even exactly. know whether I'll be, it will easily be a, a sellable. At the point, sometimes you may be told that, okay, maybe you need three weeks for this, uh, 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 for your, if you decide to sell. Because we, we have known the history of the behavior of the policymakers of this country. So that brings us to the issue of confidence in this measure. And this uh, measure was received with so many mixed feelings by the public. And with some sections of the society are pointing out that they will promote rent-seeking behaviors in the, in the economy. What is your comment on this? Yes, clearly there's opportunity for, for rent-seeking. Rent-seeking means you buy low, you sell high, depending on the market that, that's there. So like I said, yeah, if, if, if I buy in Zim dollar, right? I buy in Zim dollar, um, what then happens is that I will hold on to that, um, to that, to that currency and tomorrow I sell the same dollar the, the same coin, and the portion of the local currency that I receive at that point 
is not dependent on the value of the money a uh, uh, not bought the coins. It's dependent on the price that's prevailing on the London Metro Exchange. So I'll still get a higher value. And I sell that and continue. So there's opportunity for people to continue to play on the same market or even to take the gold itself and deprive that gold coin of the 4.4 grams that's on it and sell it uh, 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 for, for, for real U.S. dollars. So I think there is a uh, huge opportunities for arbitrage. And what arbitrage causes is it speeds up the rate of uh, currency depreciation. It has been happening where people would be able to borrow uh, over the past few months. People would go and borrow uh, when the uh, interest rates were about 80%. Uh, inflation was rising higher. And in three months, you'll be able to pay back your local currency loan, but you would have used the money to buy so many other assets which would have gone up in value. Mm. So there's clearly significant room for arbitrage in that market, just as what has been happening, say, on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. Right, okay, that really gives us a lot to think about, a lot to consider. And we're just going to take another break now, and then we'll just finish up with the final segment. Welcome to our third and final section, and we're just here talking about the gold coins with respect from equity access. Respect, you know, there's been a lot of skepticism. I'm just going to keep on hammering on that, all right, on the issue of skepticism, because at the end of the day, the policy, the policies are made for the citizens, right, and to just improve the economy. Um, skepticism and public confidence deficit in the, in the currency regime are a, a true reality. In your view, do you think this will have an effect on the on the uptake or on the reception and effectiveness of the gold coins? In the general people's view, um, our country is not a stable country when it comes to currency issues, and therefore there is little um, confidence in the in the decision makers or in, in 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 authorities in Zimbabwe by the citizens. So clearly, this will have a huge uh, bearing on the citizens' uptake of the, of, the, of the coins. And I think uh, even beyond that, when you look at the price point, it's not for an every um, ordinary citizen uh, who does have got uh, 300 US dollars to set aside. What Zimbabweans need um, uh, um, is, is, is just um, a currency that they are able to utilize um, over a period of time without necessarily losing value. And so there are few Zimbabweans with ability or with uh, sufficient funds to even save in the first place. So I don't think that um, this measure will be taken um, up uh, in, a, in the way that uh, government uh, sees it being taken up by, by the citizens. I think in as much as they might be trying to rebuild confidence, it's very difficult to even start to try uh, on them in in the first place, so um, we need to solve our confidence uh, issues. Uh, but this transparency doesn't start from money. You start from basic things like corruption, dealing with corruption issues. You know, um, uh, issues of rule of law, etc. All those things need to be upheld in order to start to see citizens believing in their government, believing in the measures that government would have put in place to try to um, help. Uh, the economy. All right. Now, you know, inflation has been going wild in Zimbabwe for years now, but then right now we're at a very critical stage where it's just runaway like we were just discussing. And the Zim dollar continues to depreciate. Um, 
what do you think is going amiss? What is the government doing wrong or what should they put in place to just make sure that there's macroeconomic stability? do that then it means your budget can balance and when it balances you start to look at ways of increasing production ways of growing your pace and when your pace grows you can equally adjust your consumption in line with that growth but if your expenditure is always up there it means you create deficits and those deficits are what fuels this this money supply growth so this is the challenge that needs to be done at hand we've got a huge money supply which government doesn't know what, to, what it, it should do with, uh, then it starts creating all these forms of um, assets so as to try to mop up that excess liquidity. So we should go back uh, to trying uh, 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 to live within our, ex uh, our means. And uh, much of this also is driven by populist policies. Populist policies, um, when you don't look at the rationale or the cost benefit, you are simply saying, if I do this, I know that uh, people will love me, but you, you are doing it outside. It's like borrowing to cover a friend's uh, 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 own needs. In other words, you are creating a problem for yourself, but you are pleasing your friend. So you will have a friend who will say, my friend is uh, really loving. But when the bank starts following up on the debt that you have, it's you who is there. So we've had a government which has got appetite to fund things that are outside of budget, like the command agriculture, and we're still within those um, uh, funded programs. There's also a huge corruption and so and so forth. So all this increases the cost at which government um, has to suit its uh, its its liabilities. So I think we need to go back to 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 to, to basic, which is basic economics that 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 needs to be done. I think from there we can start to rebuild as a country. But it's beyond just uh, the budget. It's it's equally issues to do with rule of law, ETC. When someone puts a policy measure and they really know that uh, there are consequences to possibly um, issues of, 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 of corruption and so forth, definitely uh, uh, they, they can be guarded by, by this rule of law to say, uh, if I'm caught, I will go to jail, ETC. So I think there are a whole lot of components within the economy, a new culture that needs to be uh, natured to refocus the country on a trajectory where we can say find the risk stability um, we can now as Zimbabweans you know look at other issues of economic growth etc so our current situation is not nearly as complicated as they make uh, it out just last year Zambia had elections and uh, the uh, sitting the current president who won he, he didn't do much Zambia was sitting on a huge debt with the IMF uh, and also with the Chinese but um, it was causing huge uh, swings in its currency. But uh, to date, Zambia's currency is one of the best performing in the world. Its inflation came from double digits. It's now, it's now about 7%. And, and it's not because they did much. It's not like they restructured. It's the confidence that has come in. Investors are feeling that, okay, there's a new administration which is accountable. And they are ready to work with that administration. And you know how investments work. Investments, uh, people don't have to wait for things to be okay. For you to make money as an investor, you need to project and see the trajectory which, which, which a country is taking or an, an investment vehicle is taking. So if you see that this country is going in the right direction, you move ahead of the pack. Mm -hmm. So investors are already 
uh, uh, pushing money and their focus on, on to Zambia, into Zambia, even before Zambia clears its debt, is because they have confidence that once these fundamentals that these guys have put in place are in order, I think obviously the country is supposed to go in the, in the, in the right direction. All right. Okay, so we play a game here on this show. What happens is the guest will ask a question to the next guest, mm -hmm. and then you have to answer the question. Okay. In turn, you ask a question to the next guest, right? <laughs> so you don't know who it is, mm -hmm. and um, you don't know what the question is until I ask. So your question actually has something to do with public debt. Our last guest asked, um, what can the citizens do, the citizens of Zimbabwe, what can they do to ensure that the government takes the issue of public debt seriously? Okay. Um, what can the citizens or what, what can, can the government do? No, no, no. The government has a lot to do. Yeah. But what can the citizens do? Okay. So I think for citizens... Um, Everything starts with knowledge. Uh, you cannot assume that um, a person driving a Range Rover could be driving it based on a, on, on, on date, on debt, mm -hmm. right? The easiest assumption from how we grew up is when you see you drive the best car, it means you've earned it, right? So it's, 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 it's a form of education uh, that um, really expands. I'm sure there are so many bodies that are involved in that space, um, public debt management and and um, publicizing what's happening within the within that space, but um, I think for the generality of the citizens, no one even knows uh, that the government has debt and that government can actually accrue debt. So um, for somebody to then come and then say, uh, can citizens do something? I think it starts from the point of of knowledge. Are we educating citizens enough? But uh, do we have the right systems in place that can ensure that the public becomes so engaged in these matters? But you are a citizen. What do you mean, are we educating the citizens? You said, what can the citizens do? And the citizens are the broader uh, or the generality, of, uh, the generality of, of Zimbabweans. When you talk of a, a, a few that are acquainted and that deal with these matters, like me, I can tell you debt year on year, what Zimbabwe's debt is looking like, what they have been paying, ETC, and what they have not been paying, and the consequences of doing so. But I think what we are trying to achieve at the end of the day, because we want citizens to do something. And I think what citizens need to do is advocacy, really, uh, because it's not citizens that should put together that money in, in any kind of way. So to me, the role of citizens only happens at advocacy level. Are they putting pressure on their MPs to uh, take their case to parliament and put to task uh, 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 the authorities? Are they mobilizing to engage government in other different uh, ways? But in order for you to, 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 to advocate, it's because you know what's at stake. You know the implication. And for you to know, it's because you have been educated. So I think we should have a robust system that ensures that there's a broad appreciation of what's at stake. Uh, because when you push the narrative of sanctions, it's easier to say we are not receiving global um, uh, finances because of sanctions. But much of the challenges that we have, the reason why we are not receiving international finance is partly because we owe some of these institutions. But in, when you owe someone, you are supposed to pay. But it's, it's the public which then says no, uh, when when uh, uh, budgetary consultations are being done, citizens should also um, ask for a fair share of uh, the, the part of the debt that should be cleared. Because as it stands right now, government has been paying only tokens uh, to the to the to the to the rest of the um, uh, creditors globally. So I think it's mainly a matter of advocacy, but advocacy coming out of um, education and uh, just pushing authorities to to do what they sh they should do. All right. Thank you so much for that. What's your question to our next guest? Um, it depends with whether they are in the field of uh, economics or uh, maybe they are in the field of politics. But I think um, yeah, my question... to make it too uh, specialized. Okay. 
Um, my, my, my question is, is it uh, feasible for any um, civilized nation to grow its economy without the, um, without the help or without the buy-in of other countries? In other words, is it feasible for a country to uh, grow just using domestic funds without? And if so, how? Right. Okay, that's two questions, but I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Respect, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And I'm sure our viewers have learned a lot because many people had, well, really, all Zimbabweans had many questions around this issue and they wanted to understand it and you really unpacked it quite well enough for the layman to understand this issue. So thank you so much for doing that. Thanks, Delay. Thanks, viewers. And to our viewers, thank you so much for joining us this week. Please join us once again next week.